to, they tend to hold their head a little higher, right? And they just have a, a personality about them that's just attractive. When you walk into a room and you see them, you ju- you're drawn to them and you just want to go to them because you know they always have something encouraging to say to you, right? Even, even when you know that, that their life is, is a mess and they're, they're going through some, some difficult times, they're still more interested in lifting you up than they are talking about their own problems, right? People like that are just really fun to be around. We, we want to be around those people. They just have an energy about them that just makes you love them, and, and it's, it's a very attractive quality in a person. Now, if you leave your eyes closed, let, I want you to just one more minute. Let's think of the opposite. Who is the grumpiest person you've ever known in your life? Right. What's the, the first face that pops into your head? Now, if the person's sitting next to you, please do not say it out loud. But, what, right, zoom in on their face. What, what makes them so grumpy? Right? It's probably the opposite of what we just said. Right? Their face has been, they've been frowning for so long that their face is permanently stuck that way. The, the angry lines in their forehead are, are permanent now. Right? Uh, and oftentimes, they, they tend to just walk with their heads down, which pulls their shoulders forward. And their entire posture and their demeanor just says, I don't like people. Right? And these people, when you see them walk into a room, you just try to not make eye contact with you so they don't come talk to you and try to avoid them. And when you do talk to them, th- all they want to do is complain. And they just suck the energy out of a room. They want to... Right? They, they never have anything good to say, and they're just so drawn to, to negativity that even when they don't have anything to complain about in their lives, they seek out other negative people to complain on their behalf. Right? You can, right, one last question for you. If you were to ask the people closest to you, which end of the spectrum would you fall towards? Right? I want you to be honest with yourself. What kind of a reputation do you have with other people? Would you be known as a joyful person or a miserable person? Right, and I'll let you open your eyes now before you fall asleep. But that's what I want to talk today. How do we, because I think we all admit we want to be a joyful person, right? Nobody, nobody wants to be a grumpy person. And a lot of times the grumpy people are in denial that they are a grumpy, miserable person. We all want to be a joyful person. But then how do we become that? And so that's what we're going to look at in, uh, we're going to be in Philippians 4, and we're going to read verses 4 through 7. So we already read them once, but we're going to read it again um, straight through, just, just four verses. Uh, so it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In peace, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So my outline for today is we are just going to simply walk through these four verses one verse at a time, and we're going to pick them apart, and then at the end, we'll come back to that question, right? How do we become a joyful person, right? How do we become the people that people, that everyone else in the room doesn't want to avoid and and resents every time they have to be in a conversation with you, right? We can all agree we don't like those people, so let's not be that to other people as well. So let's just start reading in verse 4. Again, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now notice he says it twice. That means it's important. Unlike your, when you you have young children, they just go, Mom, 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 Mom. What do you want? Nothing. Right? In, In the Bible and in ancient literature and still today, right, repeating something was, right, saying this is important. Listen up. Um, they didn't have punctuation and exclamation points in ancient Greek. So when they wanted to make, make a point come across clear, they would repeat it. Right? When they wanted to make a point come across, across clear, they would repeat it. See, it works. Right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Right? So this is a command to be joyful. Right? The Bible commands us to be joyful. 
which means if you are a grumpy Christian, you are being disobedient to what God says. Now, we have to talk for a second, what exactly does joy mean? So joy is associated with, with happiness, but it's a little bit beyond that. And I like to explain it this way. Joy is to happiness what depression is to sadness. Now, depression is something that's been talked a lot about in our society. It's something that a lot of people struggle with, and so there's been a lot of light shined onto depression and a lot of discussions happening in our culture about that, which is great. It needs to be talked about. But depression, it, one, one symptom of depression, one way of explaining depression is depression is feeling sad even when you have no reason to be sad. Right? We understand that even when things are going good, you still feel down on yourself. That is a sign of depression. And so joy is to happiness what depression is to sadness. Even when things are going bad, you still have a reason to feel happy. Right? So happiness and sadness are emotions. And emotions change very fast. You do not want to live your life based on emotions. Right? I'll give you an example. When I eat Taco Bell, I get very happy for a very short amount of time. And then that starts going through your body and you're not so happy anymore. Right? But emotions must follow truth. If you let your life, if your life is led by emotions, you are going to be a roller coaster and you are going to be all over the place and nobody's going to want to be around you. You're going to be up one second and down the next second. And you're going to be all over the place. And so if you let your life, if you let your mood be dictated by your situation, you're going to be all over the place. But joy is choosing to be joyful and choosing to be happiness even when your situations are bad, right? So as Christians, we have the ability to choose joy. It's not just a feeling that happens to us, but it's something that we can choose, right? So this is a command. He's telling us to choose joy, right? When things are good, choose to be joyful. When things are bad, choose to be joyful. We talked a lot about this last week, right? Even when, when we don't have, when it doesn't seem like we have things to be thankful for, we have a God who loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That right there in itself is a reason to choose joy. That can never be taken away from you. That will never leave you. So we can choose joy, right? So I, I mentioned, I started to say this earlier, but Right? If we're commanded to choose joy, then a grumpy Christian is a bad Christian. Right? A grumpy Christian is a bad Christian. You are being disobedient to what, what Paul tells us to do in this passage. Right? We are not choosing joy, which the Bible commands us to do. Now, you can be a bad Christian and still be a Christian. Right? There's going to be a lot of grumpy Christians that will still make it into heaven, but once they get there, they're going to realize that they don't fit in very well, right? You're not going to want to be grumpy when we get to heaven. So let's practice that attitude now because when we get to heaven, it's going to be a whole lot of rejoicing and thanking God when we actually get to see Jesus face to face. So let's start practicing that now because a grumpy Christian is a bad Christian, right? If you are a grumpy Christian, nobody wants to be around you, right? And we do not want you to be the face of LRA Baptist Church, if you are a grumpy picture, or Christian, right? If we make, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be putting your portrait on our Facebook page or on our website, saying everybody come, come join Ellery, and then have a picture of somebody frowning who's miserable all the time, right? Nobody likes those people. Let's not be those people, right? So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And then he goes on to say in verse five, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Right, your reasonableness. This is, right, this has to do with our reputation to other people. Are you known as being a reasonable person? Are you known as being an encouraging person? Or are you known as being argumentative? Because we all know some argumentative people, right? Which end of the spectrum do they fall on? The joyful end or the miserable end, right? The argumentative people are always down on the miserable end. Right? So we need to live a life that is reasonable, that is encouraging, that is uplifting. Right? So as Christians, we are commanded to speak the truth 
in love, right? If the Bible says something, we are going to proudly declare it, but you don't have to be a jerk when you do it. There's, I've met a lot of Christians who are just jerks. They're like, that's a sin. Yes, it is, but there's a way to communicate that that is loving that will make people want to respond positively to it. Right? I'm not saying you need to abandon everything that you believe in just in accept everybody exactly the way they are. That's not what the Bible says. But the Bible says that we need to speak the truth in love. If you speak the truth, but you do it in an unloving way, it's useless because they're not going to listen to the truth, right? So we need to be known as a, our reputation needs to be based on our reasonableness, right? Because you can be right about something, but not be righteous about it. Does that make sense? Right? If, if you win the argument, but you lose that person's respect, it's useless. You have won the battle, but you've lost the war because nobody's ever been argued into their faith. Right? You can't, right? It's not about just having the right arguments or making somebody look bad. That's not going to convince somebody to want to become a Christian. But it's about the way that you love them. Again, we don't back off from what the Bible says, but we do it in a loving, reasonable way. And then Jesus is the ultimate example of this, which I think Jesus is the ultimate example of everything we should strive to be. But in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, he says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Right? So to be reasonable, we need to have the same attitude that Jesus had. Jesus did not back down, but he also didn't fight back all the time. Right? So we need to have a loving, joyful, generous attitude towards other people. But then in the second half of the verse, he, he kind of changes his tone real quick. And he says, the Lord is at hand. Right? We've got to talk about what does that mean? The Lord is at hand. Right? And the expression at hand means he's near. But that can, that can have two different meanings. Right? The first one could be right, the proximity. Right? The Lord is physically close to us. Right? We see uh, Psalm 145, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all who care for him. And we, we study theology. We see things like God is omnipresent, which means he is all-present and he is all-knowing. So God is everywhere at the same time, and God knows everything there is to know. So it's like God is sitting there looking right over your shoulder at all times, which can be either the most encouraging or the most terrifying thought, depending on what you're doing, right? So God is near. We also know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. If you have put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides inside of you and never leaves. So God is always there. He's never going away. He's never going to abandon you. God is right there with you all the time. The second way that this could mean is, right, the Lord is at hand would be referring to time and the, the second coming of Jesus, right? We've, Jesus promised that he is coming back for us. We see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, meaning when Jesus will come back, the second coming, will come like a thief in the night. Do you know when a thief is going to attack your house? No, you don't. If you did, you'd be sitting there waiting with a gun and it'd be over very quickly. But that's why they are effective is that they come when you don't expect them, right? So we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Um, but if you were to ask the Apostle Paul, his answer was soon. And he wrote that 2,000 years ago. So if you ask me, the answer is soon. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I hope it's very soon, but we don't know. But in every generation has... Every generation in, through all of church history thought that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Literally every generation. And I think in a way that's a good thing because it gives us the anticipation. It ha gives us something to look forward to. It might be tomorrow. It might be in another thousand years. I don't know. So let's act like it's tomorrow. So, right, when the Lord is at hand, which one is it? Is it proximity or is it time? And the answer is Yes, right? I don't know which one it is. Um, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Paul, what was he referring to in this verse? And I got a feeling the answer is he go he's going to give is both. So let's just assume it's both, right? So 
right? God is, God is, the Lord is near. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and Jesus is coming back very soon. And I think this actually has to do more with what's following in verse 6 than what was read in verse 5. Because remember, the Bible is the inspired word of God, but the way we break down the verse numbers was added much later just simply to help us find things easier. So the numbers are not inspired, but the words are. Right? So with that in mind, right, the Lord is at hand. God is near to us. Let's read verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. All right, so he's, he, he says, do not be anxious about anything. We see uh, a similar verse in 1 Peter 5, 7, when he says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We see Jesus who says, look at, right, look at the, the birds and, the, uh, the, birds and the, the, the flowers in the field. Right? God takes care of those. What makes you think he won't take care of you as well? Right? And anxiety is another thing that, that is very prevalent in our culture and in our churches. And I'm going to say something, but I want you to hear me out until I explain this. Right? So don't shoot me for what I'm about to say. But anxiety is a sin. Right? Anxiety is a sin. Now, in order to understand this, I think we need to have a little bit more comprehensive understanding of what sin is. Because normally when we think of sin, sin is, right, sin is bad things. That's our, our overly simplistic definition of sin. But in a more broader sense, sin is anything that goes against the law or character of God. Right? Sin is anything other than what God has, than what the, the best of what God has for you. Right? It's, it's falling short of God. Right? And so we can fall short a little, or we can fall short a lot. And the answer to sin is repentance, to turn away from your sin because of what Jesus did on the cross. So it's not the same as just saying stop it. Right? If you struggle with stealing, my advice to you is stop stealing. But if you struggle with anxiety, I think we got to go a little bit deeper than just stop being anxious. Anybody ever been told that before? Right? Because certain personalities and cer certain temperaments struggle with different sins disproportionately. So some people struggle with anxiety more than others. And so if you struggle with anxiety, I'm not trying to say that you're a terrible person and that you're a sinner. Well, I am trying to say that you're a sinner, but we're all sinners. And the good news is that Jesus died for sin. So if you struggle with anxiety, you can take hope in knowing that Jesus paid for your anxiety on the cross. And God has something better for you. God wants you to no longer be anxious, and he provides on how you can do that. And he gives that in the rest of the answer, right? So how do we stop being anxious? It says, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So the way that we get rid of anxiety is we turn to God in prayer. Right? So he has two words here, prayer and supplication. And supplication is simply asking for things. And that is a category of prayer. Uh, but I think this is a category that gets used way more than maybe it should, at least in proportion to how we should pray. So if we just lump prayer and supplication together, but then he says, with thanksgiving. Because right? if you think about what do, what do your prayers normally sound like? God, please give me this. God, please give me that. God, please give me this thing. Please bring this person into my life. Please, please do this. Right? All we do is we ask God for things. And that is a part of prayer. Right? We're com right? He says to take your supplications to God. God wants us to ask things for him. But that's not the only part of prayer. Um... If you're familiar with what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, right, the prayer that Jesus gave, which wasn't actually a prayer that Jesus gave, but it was an example of how to pray, right? Do you all know how it goes, right? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread, right? So he's asking for things. He's asking, we're asking God to meet our needs, but that comes after we've already praised God for who he is, right? It starts off focused on God. 
and it talks about how he is holy, right? How he is good and how it's his kingdom over ours, right? We want things to go God's way, not Jeremy's way. Trust me, if things went Jeremy's way, that would not be very good, right? We want things to go God's way. And so after all of that, then Jesus gets to the part where we ask for the things that we need. In, in the same way, right, our asking God for things must follow thanksgiving. We, our prayers need to be completely saturated in thanksgiving. If every time you were to ask God for something, if you wrote down a list of all the things that he's already given you, how would that change the way that you pray? Right? I think that would have a profound difference on the way that we view prayer. Again, I'm not saying don't ask God for things, but I'm saying doing it, do it in a thankful spirit. When we start and we look at all of the ways that God has blessed us and all of the things that he's given us. Like I said last week, we live in the greatest country in the world, right? We have, right, we have, you have a great church family, right? You are blessed. And if we thank God for that, but then we also thank God, not just for what he's given us, but for who he is, right? That he is good, that he is loving. He is a God of second chances. He does not give us exactly what we deserve, right? Have you ever asked God to, right, give me, right, I deserve this. If you ask God for what you deserve, you'd be in hell right now because that is what our sin deserves. We are all sinners who deserve hell. The fact that you are still here today is the, by the grace of God, right? We give thanks for that. We need to have an attitude of thanksgiving that shapes our prayers, right? And he says, then let your requests be made known to God. So give thanks first before you ask God for what you need. Right? And again, in dealing with anxiety, right, there's situations in our lives that are causing us to be anxious. And so if we focus on thanksgiving first and then we get to those, you will be amazed at how God will transform your mood and your perspective on life. Right? So if we move on to verse 7. Right? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Right? So this peace is referring to right, his rest that is found in God. Right? And it's also, in, in the, the Greek sense, it's a lack of fear, which ties right into the anxiety. Right? Anxiety is the opposite of peace. When we have true peace, right? peace is not the absence of conflict. When we think of peace, right, we're not at war. But peace is the attitude in which we go through our conflict with. Again, it's, it's, it's a mindset. It's not something that happens as a result of our circumstances, but it's how we choose to face our circumstances. And so, it's so it's peace and joy are so closely tied in together that if you just let your mood be dictated based on what's happening to you, you are going to be all over the place. You're going to be a completely different person from one day to the next because life changes, right? Life just happens. That's how it works, right? I think we've all experienced enough of life to know that it's crazy, right? Just look at this year. Nothing goes as we expect, right? But if we have an attitude of peace and joy going into those, then we are equipped to face those trials, Right? So it's the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Right? It's literally beyond human comprehension. Think back to that, that person that popped into your head when I said, think of a, the most joyful person you know. And you probably knew them going through some hard times, and they never showed it on their face. And you're like, how can somebody possibly have it so rough and still choose to be so joyful? Right? That is a peace of beyond all understanding, right? It doesn't make sense. It's not logical according to our human brains. But fortunately, God does not think like we do, right? His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? So if we have a peace that surpasses all understanding, right? It says, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. And what is it guarding it from, right? All of those situations that are causing you to be anxious, Right? All of the, the attacks of the devil, all of the, 
the bad things going around, right? Your, your, your kid's on your last nerve, just driving you crazy, right? That person at work that just will, that is just so irritating and incompetent and you're always having to pick up their slack and it's just, it's dragging you down, right? Those, the, the fights with your spouse, right, will guard you from flipping into a different person every time something negative happens and just worrying about everything and, and trying to take everything into your control, which, by the way, I don't know if you've realized lately, you can't do that. But it's trusting in the God who can. It's trusting in a God who does take everything into his control. Right? So to, to wrap this up, how do we become a more joyful person? How do we experience this peace that surpasses all understanding? Well, we, we do it by turning to God in prayer. And before we do that, it's by having a thankful attitude. Right? If you're only thankful at Thanksgiving time, you're going to be a pretty miserable person. Right? We all desire to be joyful people. We want to be liked by other people. We want to be like the people that we look up to that seem to always have it together. They're always calm. They're always happy. They're always cheerful. Well, the way that we do that is we start with thanksgiving, right? Turn to God in prayer. Every time you come across something, right, pray to God. Pray about it. Turn to the one who does have control over it. But start by thanking God for who he is. Start by thanking God for what he's done. And then watch that completely transform your perspective. So by the time you get to, you move down the list of to what you're actually asking God for, your focus is not just on yourself, but it's on him. Right? Because wherever you're looking is where you're going to go. I had a, I, I have a motorcycle. I bought it my senior year of college, and uh, two weeks after I bought it, I was not very confident in riding, but I was going on, a, like, a ride with a bunch of people from church, and uh, they all had bikes much bigger than me, and they'd all been riding for, like, 30 years longer than me, and so I was trying to keep up with all these people down these really windy roads, and I come into a very sharp turn way too fast, and I panicked. And I see this guardrail in front of me, and my eyes fixed on the guardrail. And guess where I went? Into the guardrail, right? And so I crashed my bike into a guardrail. And I like to say that my, my, mom, my, my parents were right behind me. My mom was riding with my dad on the back of his bike. And so I like to say that my mom got to watch me crash my motorcycle, and my dad got to listen to my mom in his ear, watch me crash my motorcycle. But where you are looking is where you go. And so if you focus on your circumstances, you are going to be anxious because you can't control every aspect of your life, right? So don't bother. But if we focus on the God who can, now all of a sudden our entire perspective switches. And so if we're thankful for who God is and we're thankful for what God has done for us, and then we turn to God and ask him to help us out through our circumstances, then we will be able to make it through joyfully and in peace. That passes all understanding, right? And God will protect us from the anxieties, from the temptations, because our focus is on God, right? So, right, I, the byproduct of a thankful spirit is joy and peace. If you want to be joyful and you want to have peace in your life, the solution is don't try harder to be joyful. Right? That doesn't work. Trying harder to do anything only works for a very brief amount of time, and then you fall right back into your own ways. Stop trying to be more joyful, but be more thankful. Thank God for who he is and what he's done, and then the byproduct of that thankfulness will lead to joy, and it will lead to peace. And that will get you through your circumstances regardless of what it is. And that is how, even when things are going terrible, you can still be thankful because God is good, right? That never changes. Focus on the constants, and then the other variables will work themselves out afterwards. Right? Thankfulness 
leads to joy and peace. Right? And all of us could use a little bit more joy and peace in our lives. So we start with thankfulness. We start by putting our hearts in the right place and just resting on what God has done for us already. Right? And even when things don't go the way that we want, you still have a God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die in your place. That will never change. Never has, never will. Focus on thankfulness first, then the byproduct is joy and peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for who you are. We thank you that you are a God of love. You are a God of second chances. You have given us far beyond what we deserve. I just think of all the blessings you've given me in my own life, and none of that compares to just the thought of knowing that I have a relationship with you. That's something I could never achieve on my own, but you came down to us when we were not able to get to you, and we thank you for that first and foremost. And with that in mind, we do ask that you will meet our needs as we go through this day, as we go through health scares, as we go through financial troubles, as we go through relationship issues, right? Whatever it is that we're facing, that you will guard our hearts and minds, and you will give us the peace that surpasses all understanding, and that you will just be there for us like you said you are. We thank you so much for all that you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Now, we, have, we are not going to do uh, a closing song, but instead we are going to partake in 